Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Science on Tap. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone. We've got a wonderful program tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Susan Knight. I'm from the UW Trout Lake Station. And um, I would like to thank uh, our other sponsors of our event here, including Kemp Natural Resources Station, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, uh, the Monaco Public Library, and our uh, very good friends, the Monaco Brewing Company. So thank you very much to everyone um, who participates in our program. Um, Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, an idea conceived in 1905, that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. We're set up to be an opportunity to have, uh, not to be a lecture, but to hear a presentation and then to ask questions. Um, there are four ways to watch. You can watch right here, as you all are right now, which is terrific. You can also watch live over at the library, the Monaco Public Library. And now you can watch um, live at the Presque Isle Library uh, as well. And we are tweeting this. I think maybe I just lost my microphone. Did I? No? Nope? Good. OK. I guess uh, something else just kicked out. OK, and we are tweeting live, so that's pretty cool too. And uh, we also uh, record all of our presentations so that you can watch the whole thing later, a couple of weeks later. And lastly, we now have shorts, about eight to 10 minute short presentations that include um, part of the speaker's um, presentation and then a bunch of questions. So please look us up online, um, uh, Science on Tap Minocqua. OK, so uh, tonight, we have some bittersweet business to tend to, unfortunately. We have to say goodbye to our good friend, Tom Steele, who is retiring and moving back to Canada. This is where he was born, and it's sad news for us, but it's very happy news for Tom and his family, who are uh, happy to be moving on to another chapter in their life. Tom, along with Tim Kratz, you might remember Tim, uh, helped start Science on Tap a few years ago. And Tom and Tim were the first speakers. In recent months, Tom's um, done um, good duty over at the library, t tending to any technical glitches that we might have. So I want to thank Tom very sincerely. Uh, he's, in the, he's over at the library someplace. I think he can see me. Thank you, Tom, for your energy. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, for your, uh, for your energy, insightful leadership, and unflagging devotion to Science on Tap. Tom is part of the College of Ag and Life Sciences, um, or CALS, has been hugely instrumental in securing funding for this program. Um, and also, he knows pretty much everybody at CALS, and he has twisted not not uh, too few arms uh, to get them to come up and talk to us as speakers, uh, including t uh, Stan Temple, who talked about uh, de-extinction, Phil Pelletieri, who talked about uh, ticks, and not to mention getting the CALS dean herself, Kate Vandenbosch, to come up and talk to us. Tom's successor, Scott Bovey, is already on board at Kemp and is already an incredibly valuable addition to Science on Tap, not to mention to Kemp as well. So please join me one more time in thanking Tom for all his work, and let's welcome Scott. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. OK, thank you very much. And speaking of Kemp, I want to bring to your attention Kemp's Summer Outreach Series. They have lots of great events going on this summer, and you can learn more about Kemp Outreach Series and how to register by picking up a calendar of events right at the back of the room here. Uh, we have plenty of copies, so please help yourself. Their next event will be Thursday, June 9th, a week from tomorrow, uh, 7 p.m. at Kemp. The topic is river mammals and their response to ecosystem restoration. The speaker is Bryn Evans, a master's candidate in UW-Madison's Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology, and advanced registration is requested but not required. So lots of good events coming up at Kemp over the summer. Thank you. I hope you uh, will partake. One more summer event, Trout Lake Station, where I'm from, will host an open house, as we have for the last several years, on August 5th. 
Everyone is invited to visit Trout Lake, uh, take a, see a display of the research that's going on there, uh, take a pontoon ride, and have some delicious Babcock ice cream. And our next event, uh, this is our last Science on Tap for the summer. So we will not meet in July or August, um, but our next one will be on September 7th. It will be um, the, geo uh, I'm sorry, with Elmo Rawling of the Wisconsin Geologic and Natural History Survey, who will speak to us about the geology of the Lakeland area. So that should be fascinating. I know a lot of you are kind of rock hounds out there, and it'll be a lot of fun to know how the glaciers shaped our, um, our area. So, but tonight we have Science and Politics, The Great Divide with Dr. Dominique Broussard. Dominique Broussard had a most unusual upbringing. She was born in Argentina and also lived in Nicaragua, Ethiopia, and Uruguay. She moved to France as a young adult and then on to the U.S. to attend grad school in her late 20s. Dominique is a professor and the chair of the Department of Life Sciences Communication at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's internationally known expert, has traveled all over the world in exploring how the public deals with controversial science, scientific issues. She's particularly interested in understanding how different cultures deal with intense scientific debates. And it has long been difficult for scientists to communicate science, engineering, and medicine to the general public. This problem has been especially evident in recent years, given such scientific issues as stem cell research, genetically modified crops, global climate change that have spilled over into politics. Has something changed that some of these scientific topics have become so politically charged? And how can we as citizens make sense of the conflicts between science and politics? And we'll find that out from Dr. Broussard. Okay, so here's a little question for you. Before we do the trivia, though, I have to tell you a funny story. Dr. Broussard, I ask, I ask all of our speakers for a little anecdote about um, you know, something funny that happened to them in their past. And she said, well, um, it's kind of funny that I grew up on a dairy farm. And I said, well, not really. <laughs> About a third of Wisconsin grew up on a dairy farm. But I think, um, I think it is kind of funny that um, it's just about the most common backstory in the state. But she must have been destined to work in Wisconsin if she grew up in Argentina. But she did grow up on a dairy farm, so that's pretty funny. So anyway, so here is your question. I hope you were paying attention. In which of these countries did Dominique not live as a child? One, Argentina. Two, Ethiopia. Three, Nicaragua. Four, Nigeria. Five, Uruguay. Nigeria. Oh, they got it. <laughs> paying attention. Excellent. Dr. Broussard, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. It's really my pleasure of being here. And you, you must found, find the story about the dairy farm amusing. I have to say that uh, a, a while back when I started being the chair in the Department of Life Science Communication, there was a big controversy related to manure ir irrigation and so on. And one of my lecturers, who also a science writer, wrote a story about manure irrigation and potential environmental issues and so on. And I had a lot of farmers that called me saying, shame on you, you don't understand farming. And I say, wait a minute, I grew up on a dairy farm. And they're like, oh. <laughs> and so that's why the dairy farm is extremely important. And therefore, I added it into my bio, because before I didn't realize that people were very suspicious of me when they saw me. And like, she doesn't understand Wisconsin. I don't understand Wisconsin potentially, but I do understand dairy farms. I've been, I'm so happy to be here. I mean, I have to say that uh, I've lived in Wisconsin for the last 12 years. I learned to love this place where people ask me, why are you here? I'm like, because this is Wisconsin. And you cannot beat the state and particularly the, the beautiful northern Wisconsin. So any occasion that I have to come here, I come. I'm trying to already, you know, like uh, twist the arms of the, 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 the organizer here to bring me back at some point to be able to visit with you again. Uh, the second thing that I'm really happy to be doing is talking about one of my favorite topics, which is controversial science. Why do people argue about science? And why is that that we cannot agree for some things that look 
kind of obvious for some of us and may not be from others, and for which people really, really get in bitter arguments. And I have to say that I made my life a study in that, uh, coming from another life when I was a plant geneticist. I used to be in the 80s, yes, I'm that old. I was studying actually plant genetics, and I got the master's in plant genetics, and I was among the first working in a lab trying to see how we could use new technologies such as genetic engineering to actually uh, make crops that potentially could, I was young still, because save the world from hunger. I was part of this crowd of scientists that thought we could really use technology, harvest technology to make the world a better place. I still believe that. But at that time, I didn't believe, I didn't realize that this was going to become such a contentious issue. And as a matter of fact, I just come, I was telling Hank here and Susan, that uh, I, I just come from DC. I was privileged to be part of a 20 people uh, committee for the National Academy of Science that wrote a report on genetic engineering crops. We just released it last week. You may have seen it. Got covered extensively, 150 newspapers, seven languages around the world. And we were supposed to settle the debate. That was our charge. Please, come on, go back, look at the studies, tell us what we need to think about this. Well, we wrote 478 pages, read 1,000 studies and make everybody and their brother angry at us. So I would say this makes that it's a good report. Because at the end of the day, right, the correct answer, as some of my students tell me, if you want to get an A in Professor Brossard's class, just say, it just depends. Right? So it's complicated. And so the problem with science and science issue and controversial science issues is that they're not just science issues. They're ethical, legal, social, political issues that are very contested in the public sphere. And the problem is, like all of us, we cannot make sense very easily of things that are complicated, right? We cannot read everything. We cannot think all the time. Imagine if when we stand up in the morning, coming out of bed, we had to overly think everything. I'm going to put those pans because they're made out of wool and the temperature being 10 degrees, therefore I may be colder. No, we like the pans, we grab them, we put them on. We use mental heuristics to make sense of things that are complicated. And the problem with controversial scientific topics is that they're controversial because they are complicated, because they have all those dimensions that are going to trigger something that will make us react. This is the type of uh, research I do in my lab, and uh, you should look at it, science, media, and the public. Basically, we try to see what in the policy realm makes people react a certain way, taking into account that media has been changing so much, that science has become more and more complex, that issues such as synthetic biology, stem cell research, and even genetic engineering have moral, ethical dimensions that science alone cannot answer. That us as citizens, sh we should take upon ourselves to voice what we think in order to come up with policy that at the end of the day will be useful for the American public or the world, right? So we do this kind of stuff. So like one issue that uh, I'm going to uh, discuss is uh, biofuels. Another one is stem cell research, and the third one is nanotechnology. Why those? Because they have been, the three of those issues have been actually part of an extensive debate and have a lot of policy implications. Those issues, new issues in the science realm, the problem, regulations are not set. Something needs to be taken into account for regulation to come to be, right? And very often, the science happens way faster than the public debate and the regulations to make them. So what happened and why do people react and what can we do about it? The problem that we have, or maybe the reality, going back to the mental shortcuts, is that we live in tribes. We were talking about that with Hank too. The idea that we talk to people that think like us. And that's not particularly bad, it's just that's how we are. We like to hang out with our friends in Minocqua. That's what we do. So the, the thing, though, is that in that context, we tend to actually listen to people that think like us for science issues as well. And in this case, thinking back at what I was telling you about the mental shortcuts, those mental shortcuts can actually also influence what we think. This is because thinking outside the box, it's rather 
unusual to some extent, and all of you UWU alumni and others, of you see you have more equipped to do that. But let's say for the vast majority of people that don't go to Science on Tap events, they're not really used to thinking about science issues so much, and they're going to use, you know, like quick judgments to reach conclusions. So we live in tribes. Another way to think about that is thinking in terms of what we call echo chambers. What is that, those echo chambers? It's like we talk and the walls bring back what we think, and the new media environments tend to actually increase that likelihood of being in echo chamber. On Facebook, we follow people that are kind of like us, but also family members maybe that disagree with you politically. That's me. Right? You can all connect to some family members that, that do not, uh, does not think like you. But second of all, you know, like uh, you can choose if you go online what newspapers you read. You can actually make sure you don't even see the other ones. You just choose the one that fits your point of view. You, on Twitter, you're going to follow people that believe like you. That's why the hashtag science on tap today potentially reach more people and so on. So the new media environment increase the likelihood that you're going to encounter people that think like you. And they're going to actually reinforce those views view in whatever science topic we are thinking about. So mental shortcuts, new media environments. Those mental shortcuts we think about when we think in scientific controversies, political ideology is a big one. Right? And that's where we talk a little bit about science and politics. Is that bad? Not particularly, because after all, when you think about it, science has a place in the policy realm. And also, as I was telling you, a lot of those issues need to have some policy regulation attached to them. So let's think of biofuels. There was a, a, the recently you know, a debate uh, about uh, state funding and so on for the issue of biofuels in Wisconsin. And there was a lot of media coverage about it in Wisconsin uh, and beyond, actually. So what we did, the type of research we did, is that we looked at how a Wisconsin resident felt about the issue of biofuel. And what we found out you know, is that there was not much difference between how Republicans felt about the economic potential economic benefits of biofuels and Democrats thinking about the potential economic benefits of biofuel. However, if we look more in depth and we paid attention to how much they pay, they looked at media coverage of the issue. All right? And now we put Republicans that pay a lot of attention to biofuels, Democrats that pay a lot of attention to biofuel. What did we find? Suddenly, the Democrats saw a lot of economic benefits and Republicans saw very little economic benefit, which means that actually the same information gets filtered through the political ideology component to actually make sense of an issue. The same information gets filtered through what we call motivated reasoning. We discard information that doesn't comply with what we think, and we amplify the one that corresponds to what we think. So to some extent, in this case, Media coverage is just reporting on an issue, but it's amplifying that polarization that we see also in the political realm. And that polarization in the political realm, by the way, I'm sure I don't surprise you at all, that has been going on since the late 90s. If we looked at actually how people felt in the ideological spectrum in the late 90s compared to now, the Republican and the Democrat were not so separate as far as how extreme they were in their view, versus now you can see that the polarization is increasing. And therefore, if those filters I use for science issue, you end up having a polarization also at the science issue level. Biofuels, mental shortcut, political ideology. But politics is not the only issue and not the only shortcut we can use. Let's look at stem cell research. Again, close to heart here, Wisconsin, UW-Madison, Jamie Johnson, embryonic stem cell research, first to actually uh, you know, identify stem cells, right, actually to extract from uh, uh, human embryos in order to potentially have stem cell therapy and so on. Very close to home here. Did a study to try to see how people felt about embryonic uh, uh, stem cell related research and what type of filters potentially they were using. 
We looked at how much knowledge about the, 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 the research can influence the attitude of people. Because there is, you know, to some extent, a model that's very, very alive out there that thinks that if we only explain to people, they would all agree that science is great. If we only they understood the science, they would change their views. Well, that's not how it works because of motivated reasoning. So what we did with the stem cell research issue, we looked at how much people supported embryonic stem cell research. Knowledge explained the support, the level of knowledge, but you know, nothing spectacular. But if you actually separate the people based on the level of religiosity, for the same amount of knowledge, people that were extremely religious were discarding the research. So again, people read the same information, were as educated about the issue, but they had a filter that made them sense of the issue through their religious belief. Political ideology is not always to blame, or, like, or not even to blame, the explanatory factor. Rel the strength of religious belief can be that, too. Third issue, nanotechnology. Same kind of issue in the sense that people are disagreeing and some people are really against nanotechnology. For those of, of you who don't know what nanotechnology is, it's basically build technologies you know, at the nano scale. If you think of my hair here, this is 100,000 nanometer, one hair. So now we can actually build technology that at a nano level. And matter doesn't behave the same way at that level. Therefore, you can do a lot of stuff that you couldn't do before. So people are uneasy about that, and potentially policy implications are, uh, are, are, are complicated. What we saw here, same type of research, we found out that actually the filters that people use to make sense of nano, everybody knew the same thing, but if you look at the filter they used, it was a deference to science authority, how much they trust the expert. People that knew a lot, that didn't really trust experts, they're like, this is too dangerous, we don't want to deal with it. People that knew a lot and really were deferring to science authority supported the technology. So what, I, what does it matter, really, all that stuff, right? And why do we care about that for science, politics, and so on? Well, we can do something about it, right? We can do something to actually make sure that there are, like, you know, informed public debates about this issue. Because at the end of the day, you know, science moves on. And the public debates have to take place. But if we are entrenched in some like controversial discussions without people finding a common ground, we're not, never going to move forward. And climate change, which is my last example, and I'm finished with that, uh, is a, a great example. Climate change right now in the United States is associated with political ideology. To some extent, if you talk about climate change, people are going to think you're a lefty. Yes, it's true. And that's like actually, like I see people smiling. Maybe not everyone. Again, I'm talking about patterns here, right? It's, uh, it's not at the individual levels, pattern. To some extent, if you remember the inconvenient truth with Al Gore, was the biggest communication mistake that the communication about climate change could have done. You had something that you know, was uh, actually heavily involved in a democratic uh, presidency that ended up being the spokesperson for climate change. In the American mind, climate change began to, to, to be associated with actually a democratic argument. Once this kind of shortcut are established in people's mind, you can do whatever you want. It's going to be very hard to redo it, to undo it. So what do you do? You shift the debate to a common ground. And that's what it's all about in science and politics. What is the common ground? For climate change, you have two ways to go. You could do like Leonardo DiCaprio at the last Oscar in Hollywood that said, climate change is, is happening. We need to do something about it, which is very preachy and very obnoxious because after all, it's just his job. Or you could do what Arnold Schwarzenegger did, which is, you know, don't, I don't need to prove to anyone if it, ex it, uh, it happens or not. What I need is a stable energy because that's going to create jobs. This is a common ground that people can discuss and go beyond, to some extent, those polarization and arguments that end up pitting people against each other. I see the I issue of climate change as a three-legged stool of data, which uh, varies when you're looking at long-term from 
wild guesses of uh, centuries ago uh, correlated with precise measurements today. Uh, politicization, which is uh, allocating federal funds to support the existence of climate change uh, versus rejecting ones that say it's a hoax. And uh, the attribution as to whether uh, we evil humans are, are at fault uh, causing it versus natural phenomena like the 11-year uh, uh, solar cycle, irradiance uh, levels, uh, uh, El Nino, and, and things like that. Uh, in analyzing the data, I found that uh, uh, statistics primarily support statisticians who get money for uh, coming up with new and different uh, things. Where can we look to find real science being done on whether or not it exists and what the attributions are? So, uh, excellent point, because you just summarize, <laughs> to some extent, the complexity of how people feel about this issue. And I'm not going to be here defend the stats of climate change, but just so you know, I'm on the camp that uh, actually trusts the IPCC, the international, you know, like a panel on, uh, on climate change, but you should invite somebody else to come and argue about the statistics because that's not going to be me here today. However, what you pointed is very interesting because another thing that comes always when we talk about those issues that are contested in the public sphere is the issue about some conspiracy. Someone is there to get someone. And in whatever, whatever side of the issue, right? I've been actually, you know, accused to be sold to Monsanto after we released the GMO crop report, mm -hmm. kind of. You should, like, actually, the, 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 the coverage is really interesting. I have a, stu a student that actually analyzing the coverage of that, my study, so that's going to be interesting. Uh, and so like the issue of trust, do you trust those that, that <laughs> produce the data? Do you actually are confident in the system that is in place to ensure that we can confi be confident in the data is actually crucial to all those controversial scientific topics. So what happened, and as a matter of fact, the interesting thing about science as an institution is that as a general rule, scientists are the most trusted individuals as an institution in United States, you know, uh, compared to like a, obviously Congress and so on and so on. <laughs> but, <laughs> The, Na the National Science Foundation uh, releases every two years a report. It's called the Science Engineering Indicators. And indeed, there is that constant trust in science. So to some extent, you know, like, it is there. Like, the trust is there. But what are the mechanisms that destroy this trust for when something that contested, people use as a shortcut to say, well, maybe it's there not to be trusted, though. Because we don't like what they say, to some mm -hmm. extent. So what are the mechanisms that do that? And most of the time, that's what I was talking about, motivated reasoning. Um, so in, in Wisconsin, we've definitely had a problem with uh, lack of science in our policy in the last few years, an intentional problem where we've seen scientists fired, especially in natural resources, scientists fired from our Department of Natural Resource staff or retired or however it works out. Um, I guess I, my question would be, in your research, do you have any advice on how, how we can continue to get the point of, of science to be implemented more in that there's a point of policy articulation in science, where science meets policy? Right. And you just mentioned that science are, scientists are so much more trusted, but now it's being spun politically one way or another. What do we do? To, to, as citizens, to make sure that our elected officials are looking at the science and not just picking their favorite team. You know, I go for the Bears, you go for the Packers, whatever it is, um, and we ignore the science. You know, what, is, is there anything, and I'm not familiar with your research, but what can well, we do to, to bring that point of science, to make sure that point of science is included in policy? Well, you know, and. The, very good point. The, and, the, and it goes back to that issue of trust. You know, the thing that, like, the, the, it's not science and policy. It's a big mess where we're all together. 
And the thing is that we haven't been good at saying that. And when I say we, I mean the scientists. I'm very present, I mean, in a, in a lot of uh, circles, and you know, I love to debate with whoever, you know, about uh, what's, what's happening in the realm of controversial science. We call that public engagement, we call that the Wisconsin idea, you can call it whatever you want, but you need to walk the walk, which means you need to be able to listen, not just to explain. You need to be able to see where others are coming in order to make sense that whatever way you communicate about your science is relevant for the one that's at the other side of the aisle. I think there's different problems. First of all, science has become politicized in a way that uh, it hasn't happened before because it's very complex, right? Which gives latitude to the politicians to do whatever they want to some extent because the science hasn't been really good at engaging in a way at the local level to be able to be part of those debates. Not all scientists, Trout Camp are very present, but uh, you know, but, uh, but, but it is to some extent, I would say number one, a problem of training. I'm very involved in different uh, um, uh, things that are happening right now in a movement that we call public engagement with science. And the idea is when we say public engagement with science, we, mean, we don't mean we're going to come and tell you what you need to think. As a matter of fact, by the way, according about the motivated reasoning, all of you are going to get out of this talk with a very different vision of what I said. You're going to take what you want to hear, and you're going to bring back, she said, she said that or what that, and that was really idiotic what she said. And all of this is going to be very different. And it's good. That's what it is. Hopefully, I give you food for thought. But so going back to that, I mean, you need to be able to, to, to talk to people in a way that, uh, you know, respect and listening. We don't train scientists to do that. We don't train science to know the social science about science. What I'm telling you here is, you know what, stop explaining your science. You know, you know how your message is coming across, but whatever frame you use, by whatever words you use, but whatever attitude you have, but whatever, you know, verbal you're using or whatever, we don't train the science to do that. So the movement right now, and as a matter of fact, in CALS, we're pushing to have a class that's called Science, Media, and Society, that all the undergrad in the scientific disciplines, I mean CALS, uh, can take. So from, you know, like when they're 19, 18, they start thinking of these issues about public engagement. So to come back to your question, the science goes fast, the scientist training doesn't go as fast, and we're missing the boat as far as the public engagement stuff. I have hope. I'm very optimistic. And I think, you know, the next generation of scientists will be much better at actually bridging those divides. And in DC, there's a lot of efforts to do that. There's a big public engagement uh, uh, training put together by AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, taking young scientists and, you know, making them uh, uh, aware of all this and potentially work with policymakers in a much more, let's say, fruitful and constructive way. The, the university has a class on to teach scientists how to communicate their uh, information. Is that correct? Well, it depends what class you're talking about. They have a department. But it's not, the problem is like right now for the grad students, so like that's why I'm saying the next generation of scientists hopefully uh, will, be, uh, will be more in tune with the reality of science and politics. Most of uh, our undergrads, for example, plant genetics, uh, that, that, that uh, double major with science communication do extremely well in policy circles and so on. They understand, you know, like the necessity to think about those, those things. At the grad level, they can, if they want, most of the time the advisor don't let them. And, uh, I just read that book, Advisors, Tribes. if you hear me. <laughs> uh, have you read that book, Tribes, by any chance? That yes. just came out. And how that impacts uh, science communication as well as other... Uh, aspects of cultural. And then when it comes about it, there's another movement to, to some extent the same real of uh, the motivated reasoning aspects that we're telling you about, that whole notion of cultural cognition. We all are in our cultural groups and we make sense of the things around us because of that. So like that's the movement right now, is trying to understand all those processes to be able to actually be constructive uh, later on. Because, you know, just being there and say, oh, this is how it works. Well, what do we do about it? At the end of the day, we all want to use science in a way that makes the world a better place without all fighting about it, right? 
And can we actually compromise and come up with solutions that are good for everyone? Well, I'm optimistic. So maybe you have to come, you know, 10 years from now and talk to me again. Tell me how I do, because when I tried this once before, it was like too close or too far. Is this is better? OK, closer. Um, I'm kind of interested in the communication part, too, of your presentation and your formation. And um, I think sometimes, um, you know, we're certainly caught in a certain paradigm that we are all hyper aware of. Um, that being said, I wonder if um, looking at communication, um, if it wouldn't be interesting for scientists or um, any other explanatory discourse to actually look at um, what is the art of persuasion, you know, to start at a more basic level such as um, rhetoric rather than um, kowtowing to and always being overdetermined by what's going on in the media, which we know to be, um, you know, what it is for one thing. I, I mean, um, not, not that we shouldn't um, look at it to some extent, but I think, um, I, I think people um, actually are quite longing to have things explained to them um, and um, at a kind of basic level that would intrigue them right? and that that would be quite persuasive. But anyway, I think communications could be at a more, I, I like to think of it at a more basic level, like how does persuasion work um, and, well, anyway. You're correct, and actually that's what, my, that's what we do in our classes. Our classes are not skill classes. Our class is about, you know, like if, uh, if uh, some classes about science writing, it's about, you know, like the art of science writing for whatever goal you have. And your goal can be persuasive, but if it, to, it could be persuasion in terms of communicating the wonders of science. Or it could be persuasion about the right to your senators, what you think about stem cell research, right? It depends on your goal. So hopefully, you know, the undergrads that take those classes understand that there are different radical rules that you can apply in your writing. However, what I see, and going back to what the gentleman was saying here, when I'm talking about, the, you know, the scientists that are not equipped now, because of, uh, to some extent, the new media environment, everybody and their brother can communicate about science. But that's dangerous, too, because if you don't know what you're doing and uh, how what you say or how it's framed can actually impact policymakers' attitudes or citizens of, you know, where you are, this is dangerous. So I am a big advocate for teaching the art of communication to all uh, the scientists that will be interacting in the public sphere because I'm 100% with you on this one. Oh, okay, yes, I have a question. Uh, it came in over the internet. Uh, some scientific positions seem to be disputed by Republicans like climate change, whereas some positions seem to be challenged by Democrats like genetically modified foods. Is this an accurate dichotomy, and how did this happen? That's an excellent question. As a matter of fact, we're going to write a paper about that. <laughs> and uh, we wanted to invite, uh, for the next science festival, I'm involved in the Wisconsin Science Festival organization, there is a, a activist, actually, uh, that, uh, and I'm blanking on his name now, uh, that was a very uh, vocal anti-GMO, and that, that also, also firm, uh, you know, activist in the climate change realm, that actually just changed his views. And he did uh, point it out, he wrote a blog that was, went all around the internet, and what he was pointing out that was interesting is that the arguments that are put forward by the climate change groups, like listen to the science, are the arguments that are not heard by the GMO side of the thing, so, which is kind of strange. Well, the GMO is super complicated, though, because when you think of GMOs, you have health dimensions, you have environmental dimensions, you have agronomical dimensions, right? So you may be scared about the GMOs when your kids eat it. You may be scared about GMOs because you have an organic farm next to a big farm. You may be scared of GMO because you don't like big corporations. You may be scared of GMO because you think it's not cool to mess up at the small level and change genes. A lot of reasons why people do that, right? And so it's a complicated uh, debate, and it's very hard to say they're good and bad, because depending on what we talk about, is that there's going to be different answers, and I can come back and talk about it at another point. But uh, to come back to the Democrat versus Republican uh, issue, what's interesting is that this is an American thing. Mm -hmm. If you go to Kenya, 
and you ask about GMO to the, some, uh, you know, like more left-leaning groups, they're going to be pro-GMOs, hmm. you know? So, and it, because depending on the context of the constraint, they're going to be pro-GMO if it's the GMO that they have developed themselves with their own labs and for which their farmers can pay the patents and so on. So it comes very complicated. Context dependent, dimension dependent, and really, what are we talking about? If we say GMOs are more like, you know, um, Democrats are more anti and uh, then, then, and then Republican, what side of the GMO debate are we talking about? Are we talking about a blanket statement? Or are we talking, if we begin to talk to people exactly understanding what it is that, you know, they don't like, it's something very specific. And our hypothesis with the GMO debate is that people are starting to equate it as the anti-natural, uh, you know, like uh, uh, food to some extent, and then those shortcuts as I was telling you about what comes. So the, just the political divide with this issue is too simplistic, and I would say it doesn't explain well how people feel about the issue. Um, aside from the social filters um, that affect the way we interpret data, the data is to some extent corrupted by commercial interests that are increasingly um, involved in funding at the university level and less taxpayer funding of basic research. So that seems to be a, a big factor in how we look at things. Um, you know, the, the data that's presented and then the lack of funding for um, repeatable studies to see if the same findings come back again, not reporting um, negative findings, only the favored ones, the positive outcomes that favor someone's posture. So there are a multitude of things besides those personal and social filters. You're totally correct. I mean, obviously, I mean, I could talk for hours if you want. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, I, 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 uh, I didn't uh, explain all the pot potential mechanisms by which people make sense of the issues. However, the motivated the reasoning one is an extremely important one. And what you just articulated may be another filter that you have. You don't think the funding thing is actually great. You think there's a problem with that. Therefore, you're going to distrust studies that come out because of that filter. I'm not saying you're right and wrong. I'm just saying it's a mechanism that may tend to color how you see things. The funding issue is actually a super important one that people, in terms of crisis and budgets and so on, are particularly attuned in Wisconsin. Is it the same thing in uh, Nigeria? I don't know. Is it the same thing in France? Maybe not so. So you know what I mean? It's really context dependent that you're going to use certain shortcuts to reach the uh, conclusions. And you're correct. There are a lot of those shortcuts that we can use. It's a very good point. I have a question from the library. Um, they ask, how can we reach common ground when there doesn't appear to be any, for example, the Creation Museum in Kentucky? That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> well, the. the <laughs> The Creation Museum does exist, right? So to some extent, that's the reality. Uh, when, when you think about the, the, the evolution versus intelligence, intelligent design uh, creationism debate, this is also an interesting one uh, to some extent. And I would strongly suggest for the person who asked uh, the question, and all of you if you haven't, to watch an excellent documentary that's called The Flock of Dodos. Have you seen it? No. So the dodos are not around anymore, right? So you know who are the dodos in the movies? The evolutionary biologists. <laughs> Why? Because they haven't understood everything that you guys were talking about today, about the importance of communication, the importance of complex mechanisms, trusting the data, you know, funding, and so on, et cetera. They were just there sitting forever, letting the other camp actually very, very active at communicating extremely well about the creationism issue. As a matter of fact, just the fact that the term that's used is intelligent design versus creationism, it's a brilliant communication move. Mm -hmm. What was the brilliant communication move in the other side? Not much. So mm -hmm. the, the basically, the, the Flock of Dodo documentary, Randy Olson, is actually from Texas. And he went there and followed his mom that actually talking with other people in Texas, uh, real people, uh, that are involved and that actually, uh, you know, push for the intelligent design movement. Super nice people that actually are very, like, you know, you want to hang out with them. 
And then you see the evolutionary biologist, and you see he's making kind of caricature, and they're all very pompous, no offense to any evolutionary biologist that hears me right now, but they do, they, they're not really approachable anything. So there's a communication mistakes at all levels as far as how, you know, this has come to be actually such a contested uh, issue in the United States. It's been a communication disaster, I would say, for the scientific community. So we can still do something about it with the next generation of scientists and, uh, you know, the younger crowds that wouldn't, you know, actually, uh, that would like to go to a pub and talk about these issues with whoever is willing to talk to them. And I think that was one of the big problems with this issue. So scientists <laughs> seems to me is always evolving and changing. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I think we struggle with as science, scientists is to communicate that change. You know, one example is butter is good for you, butter is bad for you. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so sometimes it does even a flip-flop. It's not just a minor change. Another example is there were people that thought uh, from a scientific per perspective, wolves would never populate northern Wisconsin or only the remote areas of northern Wisconsin, that they couldn't cross, you know, four-lane highways and things like that. Well, we've obviously learned more yeah. about the science of uh, wolf uh, populations, and they have continued to grow. And so now we struggle with the communication aspect because uh, things yeah. have changed, and right. people point to those changes as a negative thing. And this is like a, an amazingly interesting, I, as you can see, I like issues for which people disagree. And the wolf <laughs> management one is like a fascinating one in Wisconsin. Actually, I have one of my faculty that works specifically on that, Brett Shah, if you want to uh, get in touch with him. Uh, but, but you have pointed out exactly the, the crux of the matter. Science moves faster than ability to actually anticipate how people are going to react to it. Well, or maybe we should be better at anticipating how people are going to react to it by actually finding out. And how do you find out? To go talk to people as soon as possible. And again, all the scientists cannot be in every pub of Wisconsin talking to people, obviously. But there needs to be some institutional structure that would help do that to, for the scientists that are, you know, uh, uh, there in uh, particular environmental studies, ecology, and so on, because they are involved in the communities and the ones that take care of that, right? So uh, I'm sorry, it just it does go back to communication, and it does go back to engagement, I would say, and the need to do it as soon as possible. You said something that was interesting because you say we didn't anticipate, and I don't know if you are involved in wolf management at all, but you're like, really, you didn't? I mean, you started working on reintroducing WOF and you didn't? You didn't even think? I'm teaching risk communication. And you know what's the, actually the key on risk assessment and risk analysis? You're trying to anticipate as much as possible. What does insurance do? How do they charge such big policies? Because they anticipate everything. Everything. Obviously, you cannot have the worst case scenarios, you know, anticipated, but you can anticipate some things and try to come up with communication plans for doing it. Again, scientists by themselves in each discipline cannot do that, but my hope is with the science of tomorrow, we take that into account, that this has to be taken into account, anticipate these kind of things in order to be a react, instead of being reactive, to be proactive. Uh, I've had some experience with working well, with scientists, ah. not, not that I'm one myself, but the, the trouble I've always seen is that they are at a level, and I'm talking about myself now, at a level that they can't talk down to where I am so I can understand it. And the scientists that were successful at it worked very hard to uh, almost get an intermediary educated that could actually understand, you know, argue for a long time, understand, and then be able to sell their story. Would it make sense to have a program affiliated with your program that's non-scientists that are involved in learning how to understand the data the, the, and all the arguments that are capable of explaining, explaining it to John Q. Public? Because some scientists, I have an older brother, for example, very intelligent man, can't explain anything to me because <laughs> I just don't understand. So, but you know, how do you, how do you, can you bridge that gap with a, a field of, of, of specialists that right. are designed or, or educated to be that intermediary? So, so my field, so I'm considering myself a scientist, and I hope I can talk to you all. 
but a lot of my social science colleagues are terrible at it. So is there any all the field of science have that problem of being able to actually talk to others, right? And, and at, the, at the end of the day, it's like, if you don't enjoy doing it, it's not going to be good. You know, it comes back to like if... Uh, but that used to exist. Those were science writers. And they used to be people, and they still are, like, you know, like some of my, uh, my undergrads become science writers, and they're freelancers, and they, they are trained into doing that, what you're saying, and with the rhetoric of communication and so on. But the science writer as a profession, as we used to have it, which were those translators for science, are disappearing. You know, science columns are disappearing from newspapers. USA Today has a great science writer, Dan Vergano, and actually, I really one of the best science writers. I mean, I, uh, he's a friend of mine. He then went to uh, National Geographic. Now he's with BuzzFeed. But you know, all the main newspapers are actually eliminating the science columns. So that, that profession of science writer as a translator is really not as, you know, powerful to some extent, and it used to be. Now what happens is like direct communication between science and the public. And we can pretend it's not like that, but it is. That's what it is. Anybody can, you know, send me an email, send a thing on Twitter, put on Facebook, things and direct interacting. So maybe not all the scientists are going to be good at it, but they need to at least be trained to be prepared to do it because that middle ground doesn't exist anymore because where would that be their place? Okay, you have public affairs officials at university level. That's one place where they can be, right? But at the end of the day, the journalist wants to talk to the scientist that did the study. You know, they want to talk to the person who did the study. They want the quote. They want that person. They want the person who had the data. So this person better know what they're doing, right? Because the, the, the intermediary is not there to actually buffer that. So I think that's where the problem often relies. Okay. scientific team right. that, that's a, that's that a good, is there as, a as that uneducated, uh, uneducated uh, non-scientific person that looks at the scientist and says, what? And that scientist has to answer that what question until that person understands it. And he's part of that team. Right. And so in the, in the presentation to the journalist, that person is there to help the scientist translate for that. So that's technically at a university at least, and you have a great point. In a, in, a, in, a, in a perfect world, that would be happening, right? And there's another movement that's called the plain language writers. And those are people that write only about science they don't know anything about. Because then, the, you know, like whoever is there needs to actually explain to them. And you have very good books, one about uh, uh, genes that's written by a plain writer that said, you don't understand anything you're telling me, please, and, you know, go into that. The problem at the end of the day, though, it comes back to resources. Who's going to pay for this person to work in the team of scientists to do that? If they're successful in selling their, their position, it'd be worth a fund. I know. So uh, my, my other solution is that, you know, like, for example, in labs, you know, you're going to have the one postdoc and so on that likes to do that. And that would be, you know, like the, also the intermediary that could do that. But then, to some extent, the... The philosophy of the labs has to change where they need to see the value of doing this. We still, like, you know, I convince, you are all convinced, you know, my scientist colleagues in some fields are not convinced at all that that whole communication thing is something that we really care about. They still think that they can explain to people and people are going to change their mind. So that means I don't, I'm not doing a good job explaining to them that what they explain doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's a better, better thing. Do you see my point? Um, do you feel in the United States uh, we politicize arguments about science more than in other countries? And if so, is there any particular reason you can figure out why we do or don't? So I, I think it depends on the type of scientific enterprise you're talking about. I mean, for climate change, certainly that's the case. And I, I, I would argue that, you know, as I was explaining with the, the early parts of the debate with Al Gore, this really contributed to have that uh, politicization of science. Uh, for uh, other countries, uh, let's talk about the one I've been involved in studying, which is France, Germany, Japan, 
uh, what did we do? Worked a little bit in India and so on. Uh, it's not always politicization, but certainly, you know, a lot of activism that comes to play that tends to polarize. We do have new media environment that actually makes it much easier to actually communicate very rapidly about things. So you can actually have people that rally around some language and to some extent what we call the risk communication amplify some risk or attenuate a risk in a way that wasn't possible before. And it's not always about politics, it's not about extreme ideas. The way we think about that is like think about public opinion as a normal curve, right? So you have a curve like that. The ma vast majority of people in the middle are like, well, whatever, we're busy. And then you have here the very extreme person that's pro, pro, pro. And then here you have the very anti, 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 super vocal. Those are the ones you hear in the media everywhere, and those polarize the debate. It's not always about politics. I have a question from the library. Uh, how has technology influenced the divide between science and politics, and can technology be used to bridge that gap? So actually, that go, go totally relates to what I was talking about. And so, so like the technology can, and if we think of technology as far as new media technology, they can amplify risk perception, right? By things can become viral. And the more scary something or the funnier, the more we send it around, right? And so the, obviously, this is the kind of things that can participate in polarizing uh, uh, the debate. I argue that uh, in the scientific community, we haven't used that also in a way to go back to like your argument that was great. If someone was observing the debate, you know, you could come and temper that amplification by interjecting things, you know, that, that can uh, temper the debate. When in my lab, what we use is like intelligent algorithms. So what we do is uh, we teach a machine to think like a human being. Let's say, for example, to see how people talk about GMOs on the internet. And so we teach the machine to actually look at the potential sentiment of a different uh, internet posts. And when that machine is trained enough, we kind of lash that machine and we can do what we do, big data analysis, and then we can see the sentiment of things, right? In the larger scale. Well, to some extent, this is a way to monitor what's happening if people become polarized or not, right? It would be a good way if we could fi find a, a, a way to actually think what people are saying, not to, by the way, people are entitled to say whatever they want, obviously but in a way where we can also be participating in a debate in order to make sure it's still rational to some extent and takes into account everybody's point of view. I have a question. Oh, sorry. I'll let you go first. This is more of a comment, a very recent thing that happened. A uh, member of the Wisconsin Assembly, just, this is just in the last three weeks or so, on an issue involving a scientist at the DNR, communicated, well, who are you going to trust in this matter? Your elected officials or a bureaucrat? Now, had he said, who are you going to trust in this matter? Politicians or the scientists? I think, I think the public's response would have been entirely different. And you know, and, and that's an excellent point. That issue of trust at the end of the day really comes back again and again. It's a question of, or like maybe not trust, but really more like distrust, right? And so what are potential communication process that make us take into account that trust? I think it's crucial. Very good point. Anybody else before I cut in front? <laughs> Just following up on that question, um, are there countries where scientists are uh, trusted more than the United States? Um, just recently, for example, um, Stephen Hawking um, gave an interview and he called Donald Trump a demagogue, but he also said that climate change was the biggest problem facing humankind, and he's been apparently saying this to, from 2007 on. And Donald Trump, of course, says that climate change isn't real. If Stephen Hawking and Donald Trump were sitting there, I know, Oops. I know who I would um, believe uh, just based on their reputations. Um, but are there other countries who are different than us? 
in terms of the status of scientists? You know, as a, again, what, what, when you think about science, and again, as I was telling you, as a patterns, you know, like there was a lot of writing at some point saying, you know, distrust in science is increasing in the United States, etc. But if you actually control, look at the data, distrust of everything is increasing in the United States. So it's not that, the, so it's like, it's more like the slope, right? So it, scientists is still very trusted in the United States overall. Then it, come, it becomes co context and issue dependent, where people may have different point of view for issues that are controversial to them, and you know, climate change, GMOs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then it becomes more complicated. And in this case, because it's not just a science issue, really, you know, I think people are correct. You shouldn't, we shouldn't ask just scientists to tell us what they think about issues that are not just scientific. It may be religious group need to be involved. It may be et cetera, et cetera. Climate change is very different, obviously. But my point is that other countries have been engaged much more with some publics than the United States early on. Northern Europe, for example, there's a big, big tradition of uh, public deliberation and including a lot of groups in contested science issue very early on. You know, Switzerland, they did a referendum and they banned GMOs, like, you know, uh, in the 90s. So uh, very different ways of taking care of the issues. So I would say, I would say overall, uh, science is trusted generally in all the countries we have looked at. But then depending on the issue and the context and the time frame, there's going to be fluctuations. Yeah. A question, please. I have a question, another question on the internet. Uh, do you think the public has more quarrel with scientists these days, or does it just seem that way? Interesting. Sociology of science is a fascinating topic, by the way, and history of science is amazing. You know, like, uh, technologies has always been contested. Uh, I'm sure, like, uh, some of you must have had, like, a grandfather or grandmother that was what we called uh, an early adopter that had something that was the first time they did, and at that time it looked very controversial. Well, if you think in terms of, like, uh, you know, like, cars, People thought people would die because they were going so fast at 20 miles per hour. <laughs> there was no human body could resist that speed, and this was going to be... Like, with the first, the, another technology I think is very interesting to think about is, uh, you know, the roller pen, the pens where you have actually ink that just flows? Yeah. Super controversial also. <laughs> you know, like the <laughs> big, big, you know, big, you know, that, uh, that uh, super controversial when they came up with the first, you know, like... Uh, so <laughs> technology has always been controversial. And, uh, and, uh, and we have what we call in, uh, in um, risk communication, what we call uh, the S-curve of adoption. At the beginning, you have what we call the early adopters. And all of us, then we look at those early adopters, uh, whoa. And then potentially we scream about it on the internet. <laughs> and then we observe, and then we see that actually this early adopter seems to actually be benefiting from that technology. And it could be countries also, right? When you think of early adopters, you could think social groups. And you observe, and you're like, yeah, maybe I should. Uh, I'm one of those in the middle, kind of. I'm not an early, but I'm not a late, late. And then you just, the curve goes on. And then at the end, it's really like you're the only one who still doesn't have a cell phone. <laughs> and everybody and your grandkid is like, come on, get the cell phone, granddad. And so you get your, your cell phone. So that's that curve. And so like the early one where the S kind of like moves like that, there's always controversy there. There's always some controversy with the technological innovation that we see it again and again in the history of science. Carol. What role does power and control, either individually or as a group, play into all of this? Well, that's a complicated question. <laughs> uh, power and control, well, I would translate that uh, in, uh, in uh, different ways. Uh, it depends how you, you know, uh, define power. So we go back to the issue of, uh, 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 of um, GMOs, for example. I would say more important than power itself is perceived power. So how do you feel, you know, 
you are powerless compared to others that have the power, we really determine how people will contest uh, science or technology. And uh, in the context of, uh, of GMOs, for example, a lot of focus groups have shown us that people are really, uh, uh, you know, concerned about the power of multinational uh, corporations that actually own the technology. So this is really a, a a power issue. In the risk communication literature, psychology of risk, when we feel we're not in control, we tend to be more scared. That's one thing. Why are we more scared of flying than driving our car? <laughs> driving our car is way more dangerous, and actually if little aliens look at us with our cars, they're like, what are they doing? So we go on a plane, we don't control the plane. Somebody else is driving it. And so we don't control the technology, and hence, it's scarier. So there's a lot of dimensions like that, qualitative dimensions, such as the power, the control, the fact we cannot see things, also make it more uh, scarier, you know, if it's uh, somewhere we cannot see. The power of potentially uh, impacting future generations is also something that's going to make people worry about it. So all those questions are very important, and you have, to some extent, you know, you have, Summarize my semester of risk communication. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Okay, I'll go. So in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned how this polarization sort of started around the late 90s and has gone downhill from there. And uh, I couldn't help but think about the correlation between like reality TV and sensationalism of everything and this polarization. And do you have any, anything more than a correlation there like that? Nobody, nobody reads the article that says, in 15 to 20 years, we might have a new drug to treat cholesterol. You know, they're like, groundbreaking science news. <laughs> and scientists are as guilty of that as journalists or politicians or whatever. So. I was wondering if you had... Well, you have an excellent point. I mean, uh, and again, it goes back to communication right in the yeah. middle. It's not that I'm trying to sell you my field, but it's <laughs> this other way. Uh, so so uh, media, you know, when you think about science, where do people learn about science? By reading a newspaper, by talking to their friends and colleagues and so on. And what they talk about with their friends and colleagues and families, things that people have heard on the radio, read in the newspaper and so on. So at the end of the day, People learn about science in the media. And now, by the way, when you ask people, where do you go to find out about the science and technology? Do you know what they answer? Facebook. Google. Google, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's a, and that, so there's really the keyword searches. And then they have one, let's say, 20 pages of websites that come up. And you know where they click? First, first page. One. Wikipedia in general is in the first one, so like that's a, so that's actually not the worst they could do, I would say. But so they pay, they they they, they click in the first page, and we have studies that show how they uh, they um, uh, choose what they do. My point is that if that's the case, if we were actually using modern technologies to go back to the other question as a keyword optimization and so on to make sure that the websites that actually have some good uh, information come up at the beginning of the search, we may in increase the likelihood of people to finding an information that's good for them. Well, we did a study about nanotechnology, and we, we found out that actually the first page that showed up was not actually the one that was the most objective about the technology and so on. Because very often, actually academic institutions and so on, do not have actually invested in doing those kind of things to come up with those pages uh, at the beginning. You're correct, though, as far as media coverage. And I don't blame writers. They write what people want to read. And no offense, a boring study, very objective about science, is very boring. You need to be written in a way that's exciting and interesting. And if I was very boring, maybe I am, maybe I'm too proud of myself, but you would all be sipping, right? So it's like the story has to be relevant, has to be you know, readable, entertaining, and so on. We know that stuff that's scary, that's, you know, that's uh, potentially, you know, with magnitude and so on, tends to generate more interest. So that's why the stories are written like that. And indeed, this kind of coverage, what we call episodic framing around catastrophe and so on, tend to influence how people think about science. That we know for sure. Reality TV in itself, per, per se, that's, I'm not convinced that that's one of the issues. 
part of the mix. Ah. So, uh, so it's one of those evil journalists. You are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it possible to get the bias out of the science in the media? I mean, is there is there a source out there, aside from reading what you guys write as scientists? Because if I'm a journalist and I'm coming to you to ask questions, my job is then to take that information, come back, and report it to the public. Now, most journalists, of course, have some sort of political bias because of either who they are or who they work for and the tone of that newspaper. Is it possible or is there something out there that allows us as readers who want to learn to find something that is not politically biased when we're reading about science? You know, that's a, that's a, that's, that's very, a very good point. And, uh, and so there's two things. Number one, to some extent, everything is biased, and it's kind of sad to say, but even a press release about the scientific study, by choosing some data, about a certain headline or whatever, there's a frame with everything. Everything is not biased, everything is framed a certain way. So that we cannot go around that. What we can do, that there's a positive note here with new media. Uh, we did a study, there's people that did studies, and. We followed on that, on looking at the kind of news people get through Facebook, for example. And actually, at the end of the day, people were more exposed to a variety of viewpoints by finding out about news on Facebook than if they were reading just mainstream newspaper. And why? Because that even if we have those echo chambers I was telling you about, on Facebook, we still have the, a lot of people that are different. And they're going to post stuff that we may potentially click on that we would have never encountered if we were not, you know, on Facebook. So to some extent, heterogeneity that you find on social networks might be a way that addresses some problems that we had in the past. The crux, though, is those horrible algorithms that actually tend to filter everything you see. There was uh, someone that actually for two days clicked uh, on everything on his Facebook page and then ended up with have, like, that horrendous news feed that didn't correspond to anything. And then for a week, he actually disliked everything, like, you know, with the new little angry thing. And he was trying to see how the algorithm was doing this kind of stuff. Why well, is a healthy attitude. He's trying to understand what's put in front of you. He goes back to media literacy. People understand that, you know what, if you're not proactive, you are seeing only what the algorithm is telling you to see. So go and click to some friend's page that are, you know, potentially, potentially different from you. It's going to expose you to different things. So would it be accurate to say then, whatever you read on Facebook, you should go out there and try and disprove it? Yes. <laughs> okay. I get very angry to some friend of mine, and I'm like, why did you post this? Have you actually gone? And one was with the wolf thing, you know, like, and it's like, have, do you actually go back and try to see if it makes sense? And uh, try to actually see different, different sources, just not one. You know, what are the different type of reporting about an issue? And most likely, you're going to end up having a better, your understanding will be better than just relying on one, one source. One last question. Lauren, last question. Zika virus. Six months ago, nobody in this room knew what Zika virus meant. Many of us now think this is really serious stuff, and our political response has been dismal. Where has science gone wrong in helping us with a crisis that's uh, confronting us right now? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, 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 an excellent question. And to some extent, you know, it, re, it, it reminds us of the whole Ebola crisis, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like that, uh, you know, at the federal level, crisis communication is not their forte, I would say. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and you know, like as far as like, the, 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 the response to this crisis seems to be always reactive. We were talking about proactive versus reactive, right? And uh, my point here is that uh, um, at least the CDC has approached different people that do risk communication and so on to try to see if they could be better at communicating about it because obviously I would say this is a fiasco. That sounds a very pessimistic way to finish. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to thank her anyway. Thanks so much to thank Dr. You. Dominique Poussard.